Good morning, I give you a, a very warm welcome. Mike, can you wonder if that door can be closed? Yeah, closed, thank you. Yes, a warm welcome, just a few announcements before we begin. Um, there is a, a craft group on tomorrow, um, <coughs> 1 till 5 p.m. There are some leaflets about it at the front. There is a, a lunch provided uh, today, for which there is no charge, do please stay. Uh, and this evening, uh, we have the Ayrton family uh, coming to uh, minister to us in song, to use the expression, Robert, <coughs> yes, will be preaching. Let's sing together 518 from the White Tim Book, 518, or Crazy the Lord. <laughs> to have fellowship and union with you, to admire you and extol you, to glorify you and to enjoy you. We ask this morning that the words we sing and the thoughts we have will indeed be glorifying you. We thank you, Lord, for this wonderful weather and the gorgeous part of the country in which we find ourselves and yet Lord we know that any earthly splendour is but a, a dim reflection of your own glory and the heavenly home to which all who call on your name are invited Lord we pray this morning that our worship would be acceptable and that as we read from your words and here it explains that we might understand you better and ourselves too. 
O Lord, open our hearts and our eyes. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Let's sing number 829.
I will sing praise to your name, O Most High. When my enemies turn back, they shall fall and perish at your presence, for you have maintained my right and my cause. You sat on the throne judging in righteousness. You have rebuked the nations. You have destroyed the wicked. You have blotted out their name forever and ever. O oh, enemy, destructions are finished forever. And you have destroying cities. Even their memory has perished. But the Lord shall endure forever. He has prepared his throne for judgment. He shall judge the world in righteousness. He shall administer judgment for the peoples in uprightness. The Lord also will be a refuge for the oppressed. A refuge in times of trouble. And those who know your name will put their trust in you. For you, Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you. Sing praises to the Lord who dwells in Zion. Declare his deeds among the people. When he avenges blood, he remembers them. He does not forget the cry of the humble. Have mercy on me, O Lord. Consider my trouble from those who hate me, you who lift me up from the gates of death, that I may tell of all your praise in the gates of the daughter of Zion. I will rejoice in your salvation. Let's do that now in song 379. <laughs> Thank you. 
Gracious God and our loving Heavenly Father, we gather together this morning as millions across our continent and across the world will be doing, doing so. Father, we, we gather to praise your name. We gather because you've made us, you've given us life and health and the desire to be together to worship you. We are the creatures, you are the creator. And we thank you for that, Lord, that you've given us life and the desire to worship you. We thank you too that you've made a way whereby we who are sinners need not be banished, but you've provided a way of salvation through the Lord Jesus Christ. We bless you for his life, his death on our behalf, for his resurrection, his invitation to come, his presence with us by his Holy Spirit. We thank you, Father, for the joy of being able to sing your praise. We thank you, Father, for the privilege of being able to pray in the name of the Lord Jesus and our prayers are heard in the very highest place, in the very holy place. We thank you for that. And we thank you for the enabling of the Holy Spirit himself who helps us in our praying, in our praising, in our living, in our walking with you for so many good things, as well as the beauty around, the sunshine, the food, the warmth, the drink, all these things, Lord, you give us so much. We praise you and bless you for them all. We know that we are incredibly privileged compared with so many other believers and other people across the world. And Lord, we would take a moment just to lay them before you. The Christians suffering in Sudan at this time. The Christians suffering in Nigeria and Ethiopia and Eritrea. The Christians suffering in various Middle Eastern countries. And in India, Maripur, where... So many hundreds of churches have just been burned down in the last few weeks. Lord, we bring them before you. The Christians of China and, and North Korea we heard about on, on Wednesday. Lord, we, we lay before you your people. Father, we thank you for all that's happened this past week here at Martin Top. We thank you, Father, for the testimonies we've heard. We thank you for the gospel that has been underlined day by day. We thank you that we've had fellowship, but... We've been able to make known the Lord Jesus Christ. And for everyone who came in, especially those visiting, Lord, that you draw them closely to yourself. We thank you too that not only here, but in Gisborne, boys and girls were to hear the good news of the Lord Jesus. Some every day. And we pray for those children that they would grow to know and love and serve the Saviour. We thank you for all that happened at the auction mart yesterday as well. And uh, again, the word going out and your, your praise sung. Father, for all these things, we give you thanks. Lord, as we start a new week, we ask you bless us today, here and then at the lambing service, bless our fellowship over the meal. And then as we go into this new week with all its activities and responsibilities, may we walk worthy of the high calling with which we're called. We pray for those around us, Lord. Some have no thoughts for yourself, but we commit them to you. We pray for them. They may not pray for themselves, but we would pray for them, Lord, that you'd work to draw them, to save them, to make them yours. Father, as well, we pray for those who rule over us. So many things happen in government and media 
that break our hearts. Lord, be merciful to those who would rule over us. We pray for the royal family, we pray for the government, nationally and locally, as we're commanded to do. We ask that we would live peaceably and without the conflicts that so often are stirred up. And then, Lord, most of all, we ask that in our worship together, the Lord Jesus Christ would be exalted in our midst. Wash us from every sin. Speak to us this morning, we pray. Do us good. And may the Lord Jesus be honoured. We ask in his name. Amen. 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 Thank you. I'll come all the way up here, why not? <laughs> then I can see everybody and you can see me. Um, just very quickly, um, on a very lovely sunny morning, um, I want to think about swaps. Okay, swaps. Um, things that you might um, exchange for something else. Okay, um, so I've thought of a few ideas of things that you might uh, swap in your life. Maybe you were, when you were a child, and, or at the moment when you go to school or things like that, you swap um, special stickers or cards or something like that. Some people do um, football stickers and that kind of thing, or um, I don't know, Pokemon or whatever it might be. But the idea is that, well, you get something and I get something. That's how a swap works, isn't it? You get something, I get something. In my family growing up, um, there was always a rule um, uh, to do with swaps, and that was when we had ice cream, okay, ice cream. Uh, if I've got a, I don't know, a, a strawberry ice cream, and you've got a, um, I don't know what it could be, a blueberry ice cream, the rule is, well, we have to swap at some point, and I get a lick of yours, and you get a lick of mine. And some people think that's gross, I just think that's good Christian sharing. <laughs> I get something, and you get something, we swap. Um, some people, never me of course, I'm sure never you either, but some people have even been known to swap homework answers. Oh. Um, <laughs> of course I've never done this and I'm sure you have neither, um, but there are some people who sit on the school bus, you know, on the way to school and they say, I'll give you the answer to question three, you give me the answer to question seven, and they swap their answers. I get something and you get something, okay? Now um, uh, I've brought this with me because I'm never going to remember this otherwise. But um, there's a man who made a series of very good swaps, okay? He was very good at doing this. Um, and uh, believe it or not, he managed to swap his way from a single red paperclip all the way until he had a house, okay? He swapped a paperclip for a house, not quite in one go, uh, but in a series of 14 trades. So let me tell you what happened. He swapped his paperclip for a pen, his pen for a doorknob, his doorknob for a camp stove, uh, his camp stove for a generator, his generator for a snowmobile, his snowmobile for a two-person trip to Yak in British Columbia, very nice, uh, his uh, two-person trip for a truck, his truck for a recording contract, his recording contract for a year's rent in Phoenix, Arizona, uh, his uh, uh, year's rent for an afternoon with Alice Cooper, uh, his afternoon with Alice, I've got no idea who that is, but uh, Alice Cooper for a, uh, um, I don't know what this is either really, a Kiss motorised snow globe. His kiss motorised snow globe for a role in the film Donner on Demand, and his role in the film Donner on Demand for a two-storey farmhouse in Kipling in Canada. <laughs> he swapped a paperclip for a house. Okay, and now that's a very good swap. And actually, the Bible has lots to say about swaps. I want to talk uh, very quickly about a swap that people have made, and some swaps that the Lord Jesus has made. Um, now very quickly, the Bible actually says that the swap that human beings have made, in fact every human being has made, is a bad swap. There's a, a section of the Bible in, in Romans chapter 1, which says that people all around the world have swapped the knowledge of God, have swapped worshipping God and, and praising God and thanking God and all of those different kinds of things. They've swapped it for a lie. The lie that God isn't real, or the lie that God isn't good and he doesn't want what's best for us, or, or different kinds of lies where people have swapped worshipping God and praising him and being thankful to him, and they've swapped it for other things. And instead in their lives they worship whatever it might be that they worship in their life, whatever it is that's the most important to them. They've made a swap. They had God and, and everything that God has to offer, and they've swapped it for something so much less. It's the swap that, that human beings have made all around the world, and it leaves us with a problem. It leaves us with a problem. But the Bible also teaches that Jesus, the Lord Jesus Christ,
has made some swaps as well. Let me talk about three very quick swaps that the Lord Jesus himself made. Firstly, okay, the Lord Jesus swapped heaven for earth. He swapped heaven for earth. The Bible says that the Lord Jesus, ever since before the beginning of time, ever since forever into the past, has always been with God. He has always been God. He's always enjoyed the glory and the splendour and the power and the majesty of being God, of being with God in heaven. He's always enjoyed that. And yet, we know that he swapped it. He left heaven. He, he, he left it behind. He came to earth and lived as one of us. First as a, a baby in, in Bethlehem and then uh, growing up in, in Nazareth in perhaps poverty at times or, or certainly a very normal, ordinary life. The kind of thing that, that we would understand. He swapped heaven for earth. He also swapped glory for humiliation. He swapped the glory of being God and being with God uh, and having the, the angels bowing down and worshipping him and singing to him. He swapped all of that and instead chose to be laughed at and beaten up and whipped and taken to die on a cross. He swapped glory where everybody thinks he's amazing and bows down and sings to him and worship him. He swapped it for the cross, for humiliation, to die in a, in a terrible way. And I said, this is the most important one, okay? Jesus swapped righteousness, that is goodness, that is everything that is right and good and perfect, and he swapped it for sin. Now, Jesus never sinned. We know that that's true. Ever since eternity, when he was in heaven, uh, ever since uh, while he was on the earth, he never sinned. And yet, in a very real way, he swapped the righteousness that he had, all the goodness, the fact that he'd never done anything wrong, the fact that he'd always done everything right. He swapped it, and instead he took all of our sin. He said, I'm willing no longer to be seen as righteous by God. I'm willing no longer to be seen as good and perfect. He said, I'm going to swap that, and I want God to see me as a sinner. And I want God to punish me for sin. I'm going to swap all of my goodness and leave it behind. And I'm going to take sin instead. That's what Jesus did on the cross. He was punished for sins, not his own, but the sins that he'd, he'd swapped in. But this is very good news, okay? Very good news. Because as much as human beings have made a very bad swap, and we really have, we've swapped worshipping God and instead we've become obsessed with other things and, and lies and think that that's more important, well, there's another swap that we can make. Uh, I told you that in a swap, well, I get something and you get something. A swap works both ways, doesn't it? And if the Lord Jesus has taken all of our sin and been punished for it, well, in that swap, what does that mean that, that we can get? Well, of course, it means that we can get all of his goodness and all of his rightness and all of his perfection. If we're going to make a swap with the Lord Jesus, if we're going to become a Christian, then that's us saying, Lord Jesus, thank you for taking all of my sin. Please can I have all of your goodness instead. So when God looks at us, he sees, well, he sees Jesus's goodness, his righteousness, his perfection. It's as if we've swapped, as if Jesus has taken everything bad that we've ever done and we've taken everything good that Jesus has ever done. And so we can go to heaven, not because we've been good, but because we've swapped that record with the Lord Jesus. Um, I'm going to pray very quickly and just say thank you to Jesus for being willing to make those swaps. It's not the kind of thing that I would ever do. Would I ever want to swap heaven for earth? No, of course I wouldn't. Would I ever want to swap uh, glory for being laughed at? No, of course I wouldn't. But I do want to swap my sin for Jesus' goodness and so I'm going to thank him. Uh, thank you. And dear God, um, thank you for all that Jesus did for us. Thank you that he was willing to um, do things that nobody else was willing or even able to do. Lord, thank you that we can have his goodness given to us and have our sin given to him so that we can go to heaven and be with you. Lord, I pray that that would be true for each of us, that we wouldn't think that um, by our own goodness we can make it to heaven or be your friends, but that we would simply ask Jesus um, to swap with us so that we can have his goodness <coughs> instead of our own. Amen. Amen.
Uh, thing number 628, coined by Roger. 628, thank you, Jim.
from three passages of the Bible in just a moment. Don't panic, they're not huge chapters, but um, let me first of all say a hearty thanks to everybody who's been involved this week. So many <coughs> jobs being done, and um, uh, the stewarding, the catering, um, the chatting with people, the moving of furniture, it's had so many jobs, but thank you very much. We've had a, a, a wonderful week, and the Lord has blessed us. But thank you everybody who's prayed and worked and been involved. And of course we haven't finished yet. We've got tonight the lambing service and then tomorrow's craft. And then we carry on, don't we? And um, we continue to meet together, to pray, to praise, to, um, to hear the word of God and to proclaim it to people round about. Um, uh, numbers at the um, children's meeting were not great, but they were lovely, lovely meetings. They were very encouraging. Joe and Abby did uh, tremendous work. And if you enjoyed what Joe just shared, well, you could have gone down, I suppose, if you'd lost 50, 60 years and pretended you were little, you could have gone and heard him every day. But anyway, um, we praise God for all that's been, but we look forward to uh, what's to come as well. A few people have said, what have you got next, Roger? Um, I would appreciate prayer. 58 years ago, I know that some of you think that that's, yeah, that's like half a set. Oh, it is. Anyway, and um, uh, I... Um, I was lying in bed um, in the summer holidays. My mum came upstairs and said, Roger, uh, we've got a ticket for you to go to Lebanon on holiday. Well, I really didn't want to go. I've always been petrified of injections and you ha I used to have a load to go to the Lebanon, but my parents insisted, cruel people that they were. And um, I, I went on holiday and had a wonderful, unforgettable month in the Lebanon. And it was there that I was converted. And I remember exactly where it was. I can picture it so clearly in my mind. Even the log that I sat on, I can picture when I prayed and asked Jesus to be my Lord and Saviour. Well, I've never been back, but God willing, this time next week, I should be there. And uh, I'm not doing a mission or anything, um, doing various things. I suppose in some ways, for me, the highlight of all of it will be to go to that spot and see if that log is still there and, um, and I, I will carve my name in, or at least my initials if it is. So I've got a week there and then uh, immediately come back and the next day I start a mission a bit like we've had here um, in Derby. Um, for them it's the eighth mission they've had like this. It's, it's a bit different to ours in that they have a children's meeting and an adult meeting all combined. Um, the children leave halfway through, and they study the very passage together that I'm going to be preaching on. But um, anyway, God willing, that's where, where I should be. So thank you for your prayers, thank you for your interest, but thank you everyone for being so heartily involved this week. Now, three passages from the Bible. And if you want to turn, we'll start with the book of Exodus, chapter 26, and a few verses starting at verse 31. So Exodus, chapter 26... Verse 31, God is giving instructions to Moses and of course the people of Israel as to the building of the tabernacle. Exodus 26, verse 31, you shall make a veil woven of blue, purple and scarlet thread and fine woven linen. It shall be woven with an artistic design of cherubim. You shall hang it upon the four pillars of acacia wood overlaid with gold. Their hooks shall be gold upon four sockets of silver, and you shall hang the veil from the clasps. Then you shall bring the Ark of the Testimony in there behind the veil. The veil shall be a divider for you between the holy place and the most holy. You shall put the mercy seat upon the Ark of the Testimony in the most holy. You shall set the table outside the veil and the lampstand across the table on the side of the tabernacle toward the south. You shall put the table on the north side. And then will you go please to the book of Hebrews and chapter 9 and verse 6. Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 6. <coughs> So we're in the New Testament, book of Hebrews, chapter 9, verse 6. And um, the author of the book of Hebrews, I believe it's Luke, um, uh, is telling us a little bit about the tabernacle. Now when these things had been thus prepared, the priests always went into the first part of the tabernacle, performing the services. But into the second part, the high priest went alone once a year, 
not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the people's sins committed in ignorance. The Holy Spirit indicating this, that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while the first tabernacle was still standing. And it says it was symbolic. And then when you go to Matthew's Gospel, please, and chapter 27. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 27. And this is the very powerful, lengthy description of the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus in Matthew chapter 27, verse 50. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. Then behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And the earth quaked and the rocks were split and the graves were opened. And many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the graves after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. Well, I'm sure you've worked out what we're going to be thinking about this morning. Um, my my brother-in-law John is seated over there, uh, not, not signing for him. Um, two or three days before the coronation, John was invited to go to the King's Garden Party. Can you even imagine? And um, I'm sure he was the, the most honoured guest of all the others, the other 7,997, <laughs> really matter, but John was the important one. And you should have seen him all spruced up in a suit, don't translate this dot, that didn't quite fit. And uh, <laughs> but he looked so smart. And uh, why he was going to meet the king? Well, he met the king's wife, who they apparently call the queen these days, but uh, uh, he met Camilla, and she came and had a little chat with him, or at least put her thumbs up at him anyway. And of course, it, I, I've never been invited, well, maybe I have perhaps several times been invited to meet royalty, but, but um, yeah, all my letters got lost in the post. But uh, <laughs> I've never been invited, but if I was invited to go to Buckingham Palace, you know, I would, I'd want to know how do I conduct myself, what should I wear, etc. And... Uh, uh, yeah, what about meeting God? If I take such careful attention about meeting the king, what about meeting the Lord, the king of kings? One of the things that's really troubled me about this week, and it's been going over and over and over in my mind, is that um, I've invited, I think, 10 different people to come to the mission all of whom I thought could come, and two or three I really thought would come, but none of them did. And there's a sense of disappointment. One particular, I was convinced somebody was going to come, but he didn't. And, and, and what goes on in my mind is what steps are they taking to meet Almighty God? Because they will one day. All of us will. And what preparation should we be taking to, to be ready to meet God himself? And um, you know, what would we say? How would we conduct ourselves? And what about meeting God, not just when we die and we meet him you know, in, in, in heaven, but what about here on earth? Are we meant to just live haphazard lives or, or could we meet God here? Well, when God created Adam and Eve, he created them that they might have fellowship, not only with each other, but with himself. We know what happened, and Joe's already spelt it out. We swapped all the goodness that God had for sin. And sin severed the relationship that men and women were created to enjoy with God. Sin came as this big barrier. But hot on the heels of, of the introduction of sin into the world came the promise of salvation. And so you start to read in the early chapters of the Bible and how God continues to speak to people and shows how they can have fellowship with him. And then we come to this second book of the Bible, the book of Exodus, and there are detailed descriptions about how human beings may approach God, not just in eternity, but here and now. We may have been driven out of the garden and a cherubim placed east of the garden of Eden and a flaming sword which turned every way to guard the entrance to the tree of life. Okay, it says all of that in scripture, but, but, there's something within human beings that still wants to worship and needs to worship. We were created for that and God himself wants us to worship. We were created for him. And so he gave instructions to Moses, first of all. 
as to how a tabernacle, how a tabernacle should be constructed. Tabernacle is a sort of big tent we've got one next door, and actually the um, the tabernacle wasn't that much larger than the one outside. And he gave very careful instructions as to the fabric that was to be to be used. It's interesting. I think it's twenty seven times. Um, when it's describing the fabric, let me get it in the right order. It pictures it, it says it should be woven in blue and purple and scarlet yarn. And it always has those three colours in that order. And I don't know whether you think I'm reading too much into the Bible, but um, blue to my mind speaks of the heavens. And scarlet speaks of earth, the red earth. And put the two together and you get purple. And I wonder whether this is a picture of, um, of the Lord Jesus Christ. Heaven and earth combined in this one person. Deity and humanity. The Lord Jesus Christ, fully God and fully human. He describes the tabernacle and how it should be constructed. And many people have um, had models of it and tried to understand exactly what it's all symbolising. And there is much symbolism there and the Bible says there is. But in the tabernacle, there is one place... At the far end from the entrance, which is the Holy of Holies. Now in that Holy of Holies was to be the Ark of the Covenant. And on the Ark of the Covenant was to be the mercy seat. And in the Ark, there were the Ten Commandments. There was some of the manna, the food that, that God provided the people of Israel with as they wandered through the wilderness. And there was to be Aaron's rod that budded. So you've got this... this Ark of the Covenant, but it's behind a veil in the Holy of Holies. Now, I think this is very interesting because there are descriptions about the veil. It was woven to the thickness of a man's hand. So this isn't some flimsy blind or some little curtain. This is a thick, heavy veil. It is 60 feet high and 30 feet wide. So it's a very, very high hanging veil. It could only be moved because it was so heavy with a, a group of priests. This was really heavy material. It's symbolizing a barrier. Of course, people would be found around the tabernacle and the priests could go into the tabernacle, but only once a year could the high priest go into the Holy of Holies. Just once a year. And when he went into the Holy of Holies, he had to ca carry blood with him. It was blood, but it was a sacrificial blood. And, and it was because of the sins of the people. And also to make sure that he himself was forgiven. Because even the high priest, like everybody else, was a sinner. So once a year, the high priest, and imagine if you were the high priest and how awesome this would be, what a moment. Once a year, he would go, as he were, beyond the veil into the Holy of Holies, into the very presence of God with blood. Wow. Well, God gave all the instructions about it. In the second part, the high priest went alone once a year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the people's sins. And again from the, um, Exodus, you shall make a veil woven of blue and purple and scarlet, yarn and fine linen thread. It shall be woven with an artistic design of cherubim. This huge, huge veil. What was it symbolising? I believe it was symbolising the distance there is between holy God and sinful humanity. It was speaking of the barrier that there is between us and God. And all of us at times have experienced this very deeply when we thought, why, why can't I get through to God as it were? Why doesn't he listen to me? Why isn't he more intimate with me? Why don't I feel him? There's a distance. Well, the Bible says the distance is there because of our sin. And that's what has cut us off from God. I'm always challenged by the Lord Jesus' words, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Wow. <clears throat> Which one of us could ever claim to be pure in heart? But it also spoke about an emphasis on days. 
Only once every year, on the Day of Atonement, one day out of 365 or whatever, only one day when the high priest would go and represent all of the people. It also spoke, if I can keep to the letter D, for the need of a deputy, a representative. Anybody, any Tom, Dick or Harry, you, me, we, we would not be going in to the Holy of Holies. We needed somebody who was going in to represent us, to be um, the one who would be our deputy. It's very easy, you know, to rely on others. Um, I, I've had a few visits in quite some years ago now to, to India and uh, preached there and uh, uh, enjoyed it and the colour and the smells and the sounds, etc. Amazing. One of the things that disturbed me was the number of times I would be speaking and then people would come up to me and they would want me to pray for them. And I'm happy to pray for others and I do pray for others, but it was almost as if because I'd been the preacher, there'd be something special. My prayers would be heard, maybe theirs would. That, that's a nonsense. Mm -hmm. We, we, as we'll see, are invited to go into the very holy place and uh, have intimate fellowship with Almighty God. So it spoke of distance, the emphasis on days, the need for a deputy. It also spoke of the dread of death. Because the priest garment, and again, even that's described, and sometimes you see pictures worth Googling high priest and see all the, the clothes that he's wearing and the, the particular jewels that he's wearing that speak of him praying for the various tribes of Israel. But around the, the hem of the garments were pomegranates and bells. There was beauty and there was sound. And I'm sure as the high priest went just once a year, remember, went beyond the veil, I think everybody would be listening for the sound of a tinkling bell just to make sure that maybe this time God wouldn't accept the sacrifice and smite him. And You know, I, I understand. I don't think you'll find this in the Bible, but I've been told that one or two here I'm sure can put me right if I've got, if I've got it wrong. But I understand that um, the priest used to go with um, some rope tied around his middle and the sort of tail of the rope going out so that if he was struck dead, nobody would have to go into the Holy of Holies to get him, but he could be dragged out. Now, whether that, well, there we are, Joseph says that's true. And um, this sort of dread of death, will God accept what the high priest is bringing, the blood as a sacrifice, or could it be that this time God will reject it? And for centuries, the tabernacle was there, and then eventually it was replaced, of course, by the temple, Solomon's temple. And once again, there was the Holy of Holies. And then eventually, yes, the Babylonians destroyed that temple. But, but then, about 40 years or so before the Lord Jesus Christ, King Herod had the temple rebuilt. I don't know whether it was as splendid as the first one, but 40 years later, there came one who had total and constant and personal and joyful fellowship with his father. He had no sin in his life to contaminate or spoil him. There was no corruption at all about the Lord Jesus Christ. There was, there was beauty that came from inward beauty. That there was purity. There was love, even towards enemies. There was grace that just oozed from him. There was kindness in what he said. Even when he spoke severely to people, it was the kindest thing that he could do for them. He lived in fellowship with his father, and he could pray, I delight to do your will, O oh God. Moment by moment, 24-7, he was able to pray early in the morning, during the day, late in the evening, continually. He delighted in his Father. But eventually, as we know, he went to the cross. And hanging on the cross, he took on himself the separation from his Father that is ours. Now, I've got to say, my mind cannot grasp or understand the depth of this, but Hanging on the cross, do you remember he prayed, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? How can the father forsake his son when they are at one? How can the father turn away from the Lord Jesus Christ in his moment 
of darkest and deepest suffering. And yet he did, and he did it out of love for us. As the sin of the world, passing the sins that were atoned for in the tabernacle and the temples, passing, present sin, and indeed future sin, our sin, God took it all and laid it on Jesus. And hanging there, he paid for our sin, but the Father turned away from his Son. He was forsaken by the Father so that we could be forgiven and never forsaken by the Father. What a wonderful truth. He, he was to hear God's voice, not an audible voice from heaven, but God spoke when Jesus was on the cross. He spoke to the world because a deep, tangible darkness came across the face of the earth. He spoke to the dead because the graves opened and, and, and the saints of old came from the graves. He spoke to the living because the earth quaked. And he spoke for the very last time in the temple. He was never to speak there again. How did he do that? Well, the veil was torn from top to bottom. It wasn't bottom to top. If it was bottom to top, you might think some mischievous priest had done it. But no, no, top to bottom. Remember how thick it was and how heavy it was. It was just torn. Behold, the veil of the temple was rent in two from top to bottom. And do you know what that means? It means I don't need a deputy to represent me before my Father in heaven. I can enter into his holy presence, into that holy place. Me, you know, insignificant, sinful, me, because of the blood of the Lord Jesus, because he's died for me, I can enter in. I don't need to wait for the high priest. And, and the distance, when it's been done away with, I'm invited to draw near. The, the, the God who is awesome and holy and fills eternity, this God can be my God and this God is the one with whom I can commune and have fellowship and speak and enjoy. And the emphasis on days? Well, praise God for the Lord's day. Praise God for times when we can gather together and pray and, and, and study the word. But I can come before God any moment, any time. I have a sleepless night. Do you ever have any of those? Mm. And I, I can pray. Do you get up early in the morning? <sighs> can't believe it. I was in Grassington, I think on Friday, about um, half past five in the morning, putting up my uh, bookstall in the square. And I was amazed how many people were walking their dogs. I thought, you're crazy to do this. Day. <laughs> but there they were. You know, do, you, do you get up in the morning? We'll get up early. And, and spend time with the Lord. Read his word. Pray. Any time, any day, there's no emphasis on distance. I don't need a deputy. And one other thing, I don't need to dread death. <coughs> I don't know about you, but sometimes I, um, I sort of think, oh, I think I'm going to, I think I'm about to die. Do you ever feel like that? Or is it just me? Am I crazy? And uh, I've got all sorts of apprehensions about Lebanon. So uh, <laughs> if, you, if you wonder why, you've got to see them driving. And I think, oh dear, am I having to... Anyway, there we are. I remember when I was there, when I was 15, um, we were coming down from the mountains, down a, um, a winding mountain road, and we were on a bus that was absolutely packed. And there were people on top of the bus and hanging on to the side. Anyway, the police came and, and stopped the bus. And I was, I was trying to find out what was going on. And they said, oh, he's being fined for overcrowding. So you have to pay so many, I think you have to what it was, Lebanese pounds, was it? And, uh, um, but they didn't tell the people to get off the bus. He was just fine. <laughs> so he carried on. A few miles later, another policeman stopped him. And the bus driver just said, oh, I've been fined once. Oh, it's okay, go on then. <laughs> and, uh, and like, oh, do you not fear death? We don't need to fear death. The Lord promises, once we've trusted him, as Lord and Saviour. He will go through life with us and through death with us. Amen. Anne Bronte, death is but the doorway to eternal life. How right she is. I didn't watch the, um, 
the FA Cup final yesterday. In fact, I had to ask somebody at the men's breakfast who's playing. So I'm not exactly a football fan. I have no idea whether they still sing Abide With Me. Do they sing that one at the football final? I have no idea. But they used to do, didn't they? It was written by Henry Light. Henry Light, who was down in, the, um, in Cornwall as, um, well, I think Brixham, and then later on in Marazion. He was an Anglican clergyman down there. And one wintry, stormy night, a man came on horseback with a message to Henry Light and knocked on his vicarage door and said, Reverend Light, you've got to come quickly. And it was a fellow clergyman, only about three or four miles away, who was dying and he said he needs you. Well, Henry Light got on his horse and he made his way and it was a dreadful, dreadful night. But he got to this vicarage where one of his friend's colleagues was indeed dying. And the vicar said, um, I'm dying and I'm not ready to meet God. And Henry Light said, look, you've been a good man. You've preached, you've, read, you've led a church. No, no, I'm not ready. To read the scriptures. And so Henry Light just started. He didn't really know where to be because he himself had never <coughs> been saved. But he started reading passage after passage and nothing gave that vicar any comfort until... He came to Ephesians chapter 2 and he read verses 8 and 9. For by grace you are saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. And the vicar said to Henry, like, read it again. And he read it again. Not of works, by faith you're saved. And the dying vicar said, that, that's it. That's it. I'm ready to meet God. And that very night he died, but he died, as far as we can see, a saved man, but left Henry Light in real quandary, because he knew, he didn't know what this man found, and he, he didn't have the salvation in his heart that he knew he should have. It led to a search that eventually brought him to trust Jesus Christ and became a very fine Bible evangelistic preacher, and he's the one who wrote, Abide With Me. If we're relying on what we've done, death will hold dread for us. If we're relying on what the Lord Jesus Christ has done, then we can be assured that even though we go through the valley of the shadow of death, he will be with us and goodness and mercy will not only follow us all the days of our life, but will abide in his glorious presence for all eternity. Look, the veil has been torn from top to bottom. And we have access. You and I can come into the holy place. We don't need to fear distance. It's been done away with. We don't need to wait for a certain day. And we can come with a boldness before the throne of grace. The Lord Jesus Christ loved us, died for us, rose from the dead. And he's the one who says, look, come into the holy of holies. And enjoy me. And live for me. And serve me be blessed by me. Amen. Well now, uh, we've got a hymn, but Bill, I didn't know until this morning what I was going to preach on, so I think we should sing first of all, if you don't mind, is it Beyond the Veil? I think, uh, and then we'll sing the hymn that's on the note. Is that all right, Bill? Uh, let me find it, but it just fits in, doesn't it? Anybody? What's the opening line? Do you know Beyond the veil, I now do. Yes, what's. Is it beyond? I think it's within. Within, is it? Sorry. Within, uh, oh, sorry. Let's have a look at that. Let's sing that one and then we'll see who can hear. Cheer the heart like Jesus. Thank you very much. Uh, where are we up to? 478. Sorry? Say it again. 478. 478. 478. 778. Yes, 778. Is that all right, please? And then we'll go on to 765. Let's remain seated for 778 and then we'll stand for the hymn. <coughs> okay. Thank you. 
seated. Uh, just very briefly, I, when I was up here, I spotted, um, I spotted Michael. Uh, Michael, there are many people here who very faithfully support the work of Armenian ministries. And uh, uh, it seems as though every time we come to church, we're carrying bags home and uh, various goods and commodes and, and walkers and things, etc. for Armenian ministries. Now, Michael, you and your wife, you head up that work, don't yes, you? Yes, So where do you live? Uh, well, we actually live in Spalding, but we spend most of our time in Armenia. And what's the capital of Armenia? Well, can somebody tell me? Uh, Yerevan. That's very correct. Good. Yes, very good. Very good. Yeah. And, um, and uh, the situation briefly in Armenia at the moment. Well, briefly, that's a difficult one. Uh, the situation at the moment is more difficult than ever for many of the people that we're helping. Um, that's uh, for a number of, due to a number of factors, but in particular, what, we, what we've seen over the last few months is a lot of Russians who have left Russia and come to Armenia and they, are, they have settled there for the time being. They've put a huge demand on the accommodation and that has consequently forced accommodation prices up and a lot of people that we help are renting. So accommodation has gone up by up to four times uh, for some of these people. It's a major problem. And of course that has a knock-on effect to everything else. Um, but yeah, the need is as great as ever. Um, we've had the war which took place in Nagorno-Karabakh in 2020. We're still seeing the effects of that. Plus, there's an ongoing problem, conflict still going on. Plus, Nagorno-Karabakh is still under blockade. So 120,000 Armenians are effectively cut off from the rest of the world. No food, no medical supplies. Nothing can get into Nagorno-Karabakh. Uh, and people can't get out, so it's a desperate situation. Now there are many believers there aren't there, in Armenia. Yeah, there are. There are, there are a lot of believers. Um, Armenia claims to be the first Christian country. It's an Orthodox country. Uh, and uh, uh, for many, what that means is that they have no idea uh, about the Gospel. They don't they don't know what, they wouldn't understand what we were talking about this morning. Well, um, probably have these. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but there's a great need for the gospel. But thank the Lord, there are a good number of believers, mm. uh, many who we have uh, had the opportunity to speak to uh, through the aid work. Uh, it's a great way of opening doors and a great way to, to meet the greatest need that people have. Mm. The need of forgiveness. And, uh, you know, they often are so tied up with their day-to-day -day problems. How do I feed my children? How do I keep my home so that I don't freeze to death at minus 20? But, you know, even greater than that is the need of the gospel. And you're involved, yes, in giving aid, but you distribute gospel literature and you run towns yes, and you do... We do. Yeah, so we've just received a shipment of a thousand New Testaments, which... We have almost completely distributed. The demand is so great. We've got 5,000 Armenian Bibles coming later on in the summer. We have literally people waiting <coughs> to receive a Bible. And we run summer camps, and I ask that you pray for that. Uh, we'll be starting at the end of this month, two months of summer camps, mm. about 400 children. Many of these kids have seen such tragedy. Many of them have lost fathers, brothers uncles in the fighting, uh, and many of them are living in desperate situations, but they all need the gospel, so please, please pray for that. And yeah, pray for the, the, the word of God as it goes out. Mm. And you're going to be giving away your daughter in two weeks' time in this church. I know, yes. Um, yeah, my middle daughter, Kezia, uh, will be getting she married. Was, she was here yeah. last year on the camp. She Yorkshire was here camps. in Yorkshire camps, and um, unfortunately, fortunately, however you want to look at it, she met a young man there. <laughs> and uh, yeah, they're getting married. But no, praise the Lord. We are very happy for her and Alex, and uh, yeah, they will be getting married here. Well, look, are you going to stay around for lunch or not? I am, yes. Can I just say yes. one thing, one exciting thing? I know many of you have given towards the container, and I'm so thankful for that. We, have, we are in the process of opening a new packing warehouse up here in Yorkshire. Oh, in Harris. This, this is, this is so, historic Yorkshire. <laughs> so, so we are just, we are maybe two or three weeks away from actually starting. But if anybody would like to get involved in sorting... Uh, goods uh, and and has transport across to Harrogate. 
uh, your help would be most appreciated. It will probably be once a week. You don't have to commit to once a week, but if you could help once a month, um, it'd be great. Okay, so. thanks. Well, Dean goes to Harrogate every day, so you might be able to see you later. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you very much. And um, uh, Michael's mother-in-law is the William Tyndale of Armenia. She translated the Bible into modern Armenian, didn't she? Amazing. She did, yes. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for our time together. We thank you that the veil of the temple was torn from top to bottom and we have free access to enter into your holy presence. Sin washed away and we can come boldly to a throne of grace, the throne of grace, and we bless you for that. Thank you for our time together. Thank you for our worship. Thank you, Father, for news of Armenia. And we do pray for your blessing on the work of Armenian <coughs> ministries. We pray that the things that we give, and many, many others, of course, that they be used, they get to the right people with the right situations. We pray that you bless greatly the gospel work in Armenia. We commit those accounts to you. And we ask that there be safety for all the boys and girls and teenagers. And uh, more than that, there'd be salvation to some as well. So continue to uphold and use that work for your glory, we pray. Father, now we're about to eat. We thank you for the food, for those who prepared it for us. But every good and perfect gift comes from above. And we bless you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.